Hello, welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'm Denise Barboas. I'm a journalist, and we are here today for another Stocks session. Stocks has already established itself as a space for live conversations with the world's leading experts on topics relevant to the business agenda. Today's theme is using artificial intelligence to make boats fly, how technology won the America's Cup. Today, we are hosting Jeremy Palmer, Senior Partner at McKinsey in London and CEO of Quantum Black. Good morning, Jeremy. Good morning, Denise. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's our pleasure. Giacomo Corbo, Quantum Black Chief Scientist and Partner in London. Good morning, Giacomo. Hi, Denise. Glad to be here. And also Pepe Caferata, Partner in Sao Paulo and Head of Quantum Black in Latin America. Hi, Pepe. Hi, Denise. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's worth remembering that you, you at home, you can ask questions during this entire session using the field that is on the right side of the screen or at the bottom in case you're using your cell phone. Please contribute. Your participation is essential. As you can see, the, today's session will be in English. Before we get started, let's share an introductory video. The America's Cup Match 2021. This is a big race. Magnificent flying machine. Here we go. Here comes the push. It's the fastest boat wins the America's Cup, and we're seeing that right now. Emirates Team New Zealand do it again in a new class of boat that proves Kiwis can fly. Sailing's most treasured prize, the America's Cup, stays in New Zealand. The America's Cup is the oldest sports uh, trophy ever. Got a lot of history there, and at the same time, you're blending all that history with just cutting edge technology. Most people think of what we do as we go sailing. Well, we do, but we really, it's not sailing. We go low flying aircraft, sort of on the water, with great hydrodynamic and aerodynamic qualities. The technology and the design can really make the difference between winning and losing. You have a simulator that's completely repeatable. You can uh, model the same weather conditions, the boat going through the same waves. However, to, to drive the simulator, you've got to have sailors involved in that. And they're out on the water. Um, and so to actually get the right people together is a real challenge. And the sailors are not completely consistent. You know, it was something that was you know, really cool when McKinsey came in as they you know, really challenged us and gave us a lot of new ideas and you know, ways of solving solutions that we probably perhaps hadn't thought about before. What we were trying to achieve was incredibly difficult and I was quite sceptical. We um, started off by getting the agent to learn how to sail in a straight line, um, upwind and downwind. The crucial moment was when it all of a sudden started doing um, upwind times and tacks and jibes that were better than the sailors were doing in a simulator. That was a good moment and that was the point where I was like, yep, we've got something here that is, is going to be useful. I don't think we're the first team that's thought about AI. The difference simply is that with working with McKinsey, what we now have, which is pretty unique and pretty advanced, probably doesn't exist in these other organisations. Designers can, can iterate through foils in a, a much quicker way. What typically would take uh, a day or several days they can run through in a matter of hours. Sailors as athletes and as competitive people wanted to ensure that you know there was nothing to learn from the bots and they don't want to be beaten by a computer. The bot does so many runs and to be able to go down there and you know compare what you're doing with the bot is um, you know where we see the, the performance gains. It's AI in this case, I mean that's the future. I mean if you haven't got good AI within a few years, you're not going to be on the page. Very interesting. Now let's deep dive into some of the details. Jeremy and Giacomo, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Denise. Um, so, you know, as you may have from the, the video, um, you know, a bit of a spoiler, um, you know, Team New Zealand won, and um, this is a, you know, it's been four and a half years that they've been getting getting ready for this, uh, for uh, to defend their cup. 
Um, we've been on this journey with them for about half that time. So we started working with them in, in May of 2019. And, uh, you know, this was really um, the opportunity to partner with them was um, one that we're excited about to, to begin with, but it's also very much a deliberate move by Team New Zealand to move much more into software development, uh, development in ML, that that was going to be an important part of uh, this cup of, um, and of uh, the technology race that, uh, that is the America's Cup. And, uh, you know, as, as you saw in the video, Grant Alton talking about the America's Cup as a technology race, uh, it's always been the case um, since the inaugural uh, cup um, and the introduction of rate sales on the one hand, of cotton sales on, on, on the other. Um, it, the America's Cup has always been something that, uh, well, it's always been a competition uh, fought on the, on the technology side. It's always been one that's uh, pioneered um, new technology innovations and uh, this cup um, was certainly no no exception. Um, now, you saw in the video the um, the monohull boats that were introduced, the AC seventy fives that were introduced for for this competition. Um, the nature of these boats is uh, the way that they were architected meant that Team New Zealand very quickly worked out that uh, the most important design element were, you know, not going to be the sails and rudders or you know or even the hulls themselves but uh, but really the hydrofoils and um, these are elements that go through um, a lot of meticulous engineering by by their designers and what they were ultimately hoping for was a way in which that design and engineering loop could be closed much more much more quickly a lot more more effectively and the way to do that was to, as much as possible, have a way by which the performance of a given hydrofoil could be assessed extremely quickly um, um, in a virtual simulator. The, the, it's worth saying that Team New Zealand uh, built a physics engine over the course of the last, the better part of a decade. And this is something that they've worked on um, you know, to improve the, uh, how well calibrated the hydrodynamics are, um, how well uh, calibrated a lot of the material properties and structural deformations um, um, are. Um, but they were, the way in which that boat was, this, the, the digital simulator was, was used um, was um, with humans in the loop um, and and that's because of the complexity of controlling these boats. So this is a little bit what the physical simulator looks like. You can only see two of the sailors, but uh, ultimately there are four sailors that have to control um, these boats um, um, in that virtual physics environment. And what we were setting out to do was to basically have an AI bot, a machine learning system, do what the sailors were otherwise doing within this uh, the simulator. So closing the loop entirely via a bot that could sail the boat, control the boat uh, on any arbitrary uh, trajectory on in arbitrary conditions. So sail the boat optimally is what we were setting out to, to do. And this is a really hard control problem. This is not a problem that's reducible to a few partial differential equations whose solution um, I, can, I can back out as some kind of closed form equation. Um, this is something you know, where the complexity of the challenge, the, you know, the underpinning stochastics meant that um, we tried to lean on a, a technique called deep reinforcement learning um, to, to solve it. And so the, the idea behind deep reinforcement learning is um, that in contrast to, let's say, supervised um, machine learning models where I'm reliant on a set of labels, I'm explicitly, let's say, engineering um, covariates. Uh, and here, 
would let's say the covariates would be really the control inputs and um, would be explicitly let's say teaching the bot to sail. I'm not doing anything like that in reinforcement learning. What I'm doing is leading, um, you know, giving the bot a good sense of what good looks like. So the reward function, and the reward function here is well understood, and this is a metric called velocity made good. And that's, uh, you know, think of it as, um, you know, irrespective of the direction of the wind, it's um, how, um, how much progress I'm making towards my, uh, my target point. Um, and that's really the component of the wind that's in the direction of, um, of, of my target. And so if I think about this as my reward function, and on the other hand, um, I have my action space, which are the, you know, the levers that I can pull to control the boat um, and make it do what I want. Um, I'm ultimately, uh, the reinforcement learning agent is exploring the space of control inputs and working out what the implications are for the reward function. And in so doing, learning how to sail on its own. And the, you know, that, that's a, um, a nice high level principle on the one hand, the, the, the hard challenge is getting to a policy that is going to generalize and converge Ultimately, what we wanted to get at was a version of the bot that didn't know how to sail just one boat and one kind of hydrofoil, but that could sail the boat generally, irrespective of uh, the kind, you know, the specific geometry of the hydrofoils themselves and whether they were bigger or smaller or, you know, angled one way or another. We still wanted, we wanted a bot that uh, uh, knew how to sail uh, well and, you know, optimally. And then from that, to be able to close the loop on the design and engineering iterations that the designers were going through as they were iterating on, on their foils. And the, the whole idea was to move them along the uh, x-axis that you see here. So on, you know, moving them to the right. We, the, the curve that you see here is, um, is the pretty canonical, um, uh, performance uh, against number of designs tested curve and something that we um, you know that Team New Zealand had had observed in a lot of different settings um, and they knew that the you know to the extent that they could test their designs more quickly but also as you heard from the video uh, solve the measurement error issue the fact that the humans in the physical simulator um, you know, are not terribly consistent. If we can reduce the measurability noise um, and at the same time increase, um, you know, the number of samples by which we're assessing each individual design and ultimately, you know, not be coupled to the availability of these simulators being in, um, the availability of the sailors to be in the simulator to test these designs, um, we could, move them all uh, to New Zealand on the right-hand side much more. And the thing that we're incredibly proud of is, is how much we were able to, to do that. We were able to accelerate the design engineering process by, by a factor of 10. So this isn't a question of, of marginal improvement of trying to get you know, a 5, 10, 15, 20% gain. Um, this is something that accelerated the design process by a factor of 10. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about the impact that this um, has, has had. Um, it, it's also worth saying that um, not only did this have value for the designers and engineers, um, and which is really the reason for which we, you know, we set out on this journey with Team New Zealand and built this, this bot, um, but it also helped the sailors themselves um, sail the boat and on board um, you know, be effective on new designs more, more quickly. Uh, one of the things that, you know, they still had the physical simulator, but one of the things that, you know, the sailors started uh, doing when this was a bot that was, you know, sailing as well as they were. In fact, um, this is a bot that could always outperform the sailors on uh, tacking and jiving maneuvers um, and on, you know, on runs, on longer runs, 
um, would outperform the sailors, you know, six to seven out of 10, 10 runs. Um, so to the extent that it was sailing on a par with them, um, it created an amount of healthy competition, but it also got the sailors to start in certain maneuvers under certain conditions, start um, emulating and mimicking what the bot was doing. Um, and so there's a, there's a really interesting, um, you know, um, story here around uh, how human performance was uh, of, the, of the sailors themselves was all improved by having this kind of capability uh, av available to them. Um, as much as you know, this is something that applies to a, you know an, a design and engineering process, and something that translates to other new product development, new product engineering uh, processes. Um, as you know, as engineer, uh, engineering firms and manufacturers are looking for faster ways to engineer products, are looking to bring in um, more end-to-end uh, -end virtual product development. Um, it's worth saying that uh, a lot of this applies uh, very horizontally to a lot of other settings that have nothing to do with discrete manufacturing. And so in process manufacturing industries, uh, a lot of production planning uh, is increasingly exploiting you know, the kinds of, uh, the kind of deep reinforcement learning that we, we use here uh, to solve a hard nonlinear optimization problem on an ongoing basis where, you know, you have important dynamics and stochastics in play. Um, and also, you know, there's a, there are a lot of other complex optimization problems, including recommender systems um, um, and, you know, logistics problems, inventory uh, management and control problems where, I don't have the benefit of very long time series. Um, the, the fact is that the behavior six months ago for a specific category, for a specific skew, uh, skew a product might very well be, you know, very different and unrepresentative of what it is now. And to the extent that that's true, then um, the, the promise of, of reinforcement learning in, um, in solving and optimizing over those kinds of conditions is that they, they, continue to track the underpinning dynamics. They continue to evolve uh, and remain performant even as the underlying phenomenon continues to change it and, and evolve. So, I mean, with, uh, with that, uh, Denise, I, maybe we, we go into a bit of a, of a Q and A. Really exciting, really fantastic. So Jeremy, if, if you think about this, you have very different profiles here of uh, basically talented people, right? You have the sailors on one side, you know, Olympic medalists with a lot of stuff to do in terms of sailing, training, but also in terms of marketing and different interviews and press. You have designers, right? You have data scientists. You have the team as a whole that needs to win the cup, right? How do you manage to put all these people together to work against this goal? And what were the main challenges we faced in that process? Well, it's a great question, Pepe. And as Giacomo described, uh, you know, the, the, there are many, many people involved to make something succeed like this. And of course, <clears throat> it's a problem we all face, right, in our, in our working lives. If you want to do something interesting and different, you need to motivate a very diverse group. I think the beauty in this case is, uh, which we can all learn from, is that the, firstly, the metric is very clear, right? Everybody knows that what we want to do here is win the race. Uh, and that's something that we can all remember in our work lives or our daily life. If everyone's clear what the metric is, that's a good start, right? Everybody's aligned around the metric and what we, what's the needle we want to move. Secondly, there is a commitment to experimentation um, and to creativity because of the competitive nature of the situation um, and an understanding that, you know, any opportunity to improve our performance should be taken uh, within the constraints of the situation. In this case, there are rules and so on. And then thirdly, I think, you know, the specific incentives are clear for everybody. Um, in addition to the big incentive about winning the race and saving time, you know, if we can experiment faster and learn faster, that's good for all of us. If I'm a sailor and I can get more sailing time on the water and less, you know, in the machine or somewhere else, that's good. If I'm a designer, if I can innovate more and not have to run things the same way all the time, 
uh, like a machine, that's, that's good more. And if I'm a team, you know, if I'm financing it and I can do it cheaper, that's good. So there are individual incentives as well, which tee up to the big one. But I think the most important thing of all, Pepe, is that you see progress as you go. And I think that's the biggest thing. And at the beginning, there's always skepticism. Many of us have been on similar change journeys where, especially if we're experts or we're dealing with experts, you know, for a sailor, why should I do this? I know how to sail a boat. Well, the answer is actually we can imagine if we could sail the boat a thousand times in the time that it takes you to sail it once and we can capture every single piece of learning. And as a result of that, we can go faster. Well, I'll believe that when I see it, when they start to see it, it starts to happen. So I think it's all of those things together. Um, which exactly as you say, is the most important point here, how to get that kind of collaboration focused on, uh, on the innovation, which takes us to where they got to. And of course they won, which helps, right? Thanks, Jeremy. So Giacomo, following up on Jeremy's point, right? Um, I can imagine this was a, a learning journey, an experimentation journey. I'm sure there were some ups and downs, right? Which were the two or three moments in which the team said, aha, we have something here, right? And what made that happen? What was the magic uh, sauce that made it happen and turning people from skepticism to, okay, okay we have something here as we saw in the yeah, so I mean, it's a very good question. And there were definitely, you know, quite, quite a few ups and downs. I mean, maybe speaking to the first of those, uh, we... There, there, there came a point, I think, relatively early on, just a few, a couple of months into to the journey and to the, you know, our implementation of this, where uh, we felt we largely cracked the problem. We were at, uh, we had a bot that was sailing well under a certain set of conditions. Um, and uh, we knew that, you know, we wanted a broader set of conditions. We don't want to generalize better, but we were at 98% of, of VMG. And, uh, from our perspective, anything that works as well as that, you know, which, which is within two percent of optimum, is uh, you know sounds fantastic. And the the designers were telling us that uh, at, you know the Team New Zealand designers were telling us that it you know it was of no use to them unless it could meet the benchmark of uh, you know it could sail the boat as well as the sailors were as long you know per, un unless it was really hitting hundred percent of VMG then uh, reliably, then it was of no use to them because there was no way for them to really understand whether or not um, one hydrofoil was better than another hydrofoil when all we're getting to is 98% of VMG. You have to be able to test these things at 100% of VMG. And so, um, and this is, there are plenty of other contexts where you know, getting to 98%, you know, a model that works as well as that is, is going to be, you know, good enough. And uh, I think the team um, were, you know, found themselves, I think, uh, thinking after, you know, a couple of months from, from that, that, you know, how, how on earth are we going to be able to eke out this, this 2%? Maybe, maybe it's completely impossible. Um, but we, we made, you know, the team at some point had also had to, in order to be able to make that step change, that that move from 98% and to get us into the 100% territory, um, it the team had to take a few risks. And one of those risks was just leaving prior implementation approaches. Like we, it was a kind of machine uh, deep learning algorithm that uh, deep learning framework that uh, we use called um, uh, P PPO and uh, the maybe the thing to note from that is that it's a it was easier for us to implement it's a simpler form of of reinforcement learning and uh but it you know as well as it worked it didn't work well enough for us to be able to solve the problem as well as we needed to and we had to depart and you know leave that implementation behind and start effectively from from scratch into another deep reinforcement learning framework um called uh, soft actor critic and I think it took, it took you know, quite a bit of courage to say, you know, we've gone down this path. We've, um, we don't think we struck, we think that structurally our solution isn't going to get us to um, something that will work. And we have to, you know, go down a different path. And so, but, you know, we very quickly were able to prove that, you know, to ourselves that um, this was the right thing to do. 
Um, we knew that we had something the moment that we were, you know, we had a bot that generalized and the designers at that point telling us that, you know, they stopped seeing it as a, as a bit of a science experiment and really started realizing that there's something to this. And this said that, you know, we have a bot that doesn't work just on one kind of boat and one geometry or one certain set of conditions or a certain set of conditions or one kind of trajectory. Um, but something, you know, we've got a bot that, um that can sail generally um so that's i think that's one one big point in in, in the project and um maybe the the other thing that i would uh, that i'd emphasize is just um being a little bit amazed at seeing this competition this competitive dynamic emerge between the sailors and and the bot uh, you know the sailors started spending a fair bit more time in, in the simulator than they, you know, than they were doing prior. And that was a little bit because they realized that the, you know, they were, there were areas where they could improve. There were areas where the bot was, you know, on certain maneuvers under certain conditions where the bot was doing things that uh, they weren't doing and uh, was beating them as a result in, in, those, in those maneuvers. And so to see them practicing and to see this healthy competition emerge between, the, well, and to see this you know, way in which they were improving the performance by watching this bot you know, execute on certain maneuvers and having the, the sailors pour over that telemetry was, uh, was, was fascinating to, you know, to, to the team, um, you know, to, to us, um, but also you know, something that, uh, Grant Dalton and, and Dan Berners-Coe uh, were, were really excited about. Maybe I could just bring that to life a bit because the way Giacomo talks about it, you know, he was so deep in the detail. I mean, the drama of it that I was watching is a little bit different. So what I hear is things like, you know, six weeks in, oh my God, we've got to rewrite all the code. We got it. We got to completely refactor. We got to start all over again. And we discussed together, oh my God, have, does this mean we've lost everything or are there some learnings here we can take forwards? And, and that, that drama is like really important to remember when we're doing something hard, we are experimenting and you need to be ready to take some risks. But on the second point, I mean, the drama, the point I remember is having a call in the middle of the night. I mean, to put it very simply for those who don't understand sailing and Giacomo or one of the team told me, it's amazing, you know, have a glass of champagne the bot can sail the boat around corners, right? It can't just go in straight lines. It can actually tack and go around the buoy. That's amazing. And for the sailors, when they see that, that's like a huge moment. And then the last thing, as Giacomo says, is like, I remember, and this is, again, really important for us in a world where we're looking to use, you know, to, to, to add to a human capabilities by learning from data. Like experts have ways of doing things but if you use data, you can learn more ways of doing things, even if you're an expert. And for these guys, you know, as Giacomo says, you know, suddenly once they have trust in the machine and they can see what it does, there are certain things like, if you can imagine what they're doing, they're sailing the boat at a certain height above the water, right? And the human instinct is to try to keep that height as high as possible, right? But of course we know there is a, optimal point somewhere below there where you're going to get more drive but you don't know exactly where it is uh, especially when you're going up to a corner or the conditions are changing and so seeing how the how the expert these are olympic sailors these are the best sailors in the world they are literally the best you know they are amongst the best 10 people of the world that are doing their job and they are saying actually now if i collaborate with the machine and learn from the data i can do that job better uh, and I can do things I didn't know we could do before. And I think that's the lesson that I take from this in, you know, out in the real world where, you know, so many of us are, you know, we still rely on experience and seniority and, you know, I've been there before, I've seen it before, but actually there are new ways of doing things and we can improve our performance if we're open-minded and we're ready to experiment and, and look at what the data can show us. Thanks, Chairman. A beautiful segue on my next question, which is, how can we use this in real life, right? If you look at our day-to-days in terms of manufacturing, logistics, operations, product design, marketing, you know, how, how, how can we apply this in real life? Yeah, it, it is a great question. And uh, 
firstly, uh, I think sailing is real life to a certain extent, uh, but uh, but maybe a, quite a narrow version of it. That's fair. Uh, certainly, the America's Cup is not something many of us are ever going to do with those helmets on on those boats. But 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 you know, no, you're right. I mean, in the in the business world and in the real world, uh, you know, what are the right situations? And of course, we need to be realistic. And Giacomo has described about how everything we do with machine learning and analytics and data is trying to reduce uh, real world problems into some kind of mathematical uh, problem which we can then try and solve. Um, and if we take the examples, and Giacomo mentioned some of them earlier, if we think about what we've seen here, we've seen, uh, it, we've seen a, a way of running a large number of experiments in a very consistent way, safely, very fast, uh, again, in a number of different scenarios, right? So we can apply that. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, product design is an obvious one as, as these guys were doing here. You know, how can you make sure in this case, you know, that we can, in, in a very fast space of time, we can test thousands and th you know, in a very great level of detail, what's the optimal performance? How can we tweak the shape or whatever? So anything in that space, uh, but then uh, um, Giacomo mentioned, you know, any other kinds of optimization, supply chain, complex scenarios where, especially now we're in a world where historically this would not have been possible, but, um, you know, where there isn't much data or things have changed. And look at where the world is today, right? I mean, we've had to live in the last 12 months in a world where, oh, we always model demand in a certain way and it operates within these parameters if we put our retail in the right place suddenly the world has changed. Demand has suddenly gone to zero. Oh my gosh, what do we do? Well, you know, these are all examples of, you know, complex optimization problems where these techniques uh, can be incredibly valuable um, out there in the real world. Um, there, there, are, there are lots of other examples. Um, I think um, uh, operations, customer interactions, um, you know, the, the problem sometimes called next best action. Uh, in all of these areas, I think, uh, reinforcement learning uh, is, is very exciting. Thanks, Jeremy. So, Giacomo, this seems incredibly hard from a technical perspective, right? If you think about the amount of data and, and how do we do this and what do we need to buy a, a data center to do this, right? How, how did you crack this problem and what tools are out there in, in a very synthetic way for those of us that are a, a bit less deep, deeper on this? Uh, and how easy is this from a technology perspective? Um, it, it, it's definitely true that um, you know deep reinforcement learning is at the vanguard of of ML, um, and, and because of that, there's you know it, it's one of those things that which is just emerging from from academic labs in the last few years. Um, I mean, at the same time, there are you know more and more of the things that reinforcement learning requires in order to be able to get it to work at the level of, you know, having things like some kind of digital twin that will model some kind of phenomenon, whether that's of, um, you know, uh, in, a, in a design engineering process um, or in a lot of other environments, it might be a, um, a, uh, a digital twin of a, um, you know, uh, of an assembly line or of a uh, chemical manufacturing process, wh whatever is the case, um, there are you know these are these are things that are at disposal of organizations um, against which they can train these kinds of uh, models. The other thing to recognize is that deep reinforcement learning has also evolved a lot in the last few years to be much less data hungry, which it now means that you can deploy it into you know. There are ways in which to get deep reinforcement learning to work, even when you don't have a simulator in the loop, even where you're just observing data come in at a certain rate. So a lot of the things that I mentioned around, you know, and, and Jeremy mentioned around um, next best action models, recommender systems of a certain category. I don't have the benefit of a simulator, but I can still get deep reinforcement learning to work. And that this is relevant in a lot of contexts is also because the people who are implementing this um, don't have to be, let's say, deep mind caliber engineers. They don't have to be, you know, pioneering really at the level of the algorithmic frameworks themselves. The fact is that more and more of the implementation of bringing deep reinforcement into the real world means leveraging, you know, 
industrialized components and tooling built by some of it in the open source community, uh, community some of it by commercial vendors like, you know, um, you know, like any scale, some of it built uh, by, the, by the cloud providers that mean that a lot of the, you know, the hard work is a lot less technically complex, but it remains software engineering, right? It's software engineering with its own patterns and practices and stack. But for a lot of organizations, it now means that these kinds of capabilities are within their reach. So Jeremy, before, before we, we finish with an example, uh, if you had to step back as CEO of Quantum Black, what are you most proud of here? That's a great question. Um, I think for me, it's uh, um, the, you know, we, we talk, as you know, Pepe, we talk a lot about um, collaboration and bringing together, you know, really super smart people but with a humble learning mindset, um, which is really focused on problem solving um, and, and, uh, and is designed to you know, really make sure that our work has value for, for the users. Um, and you know, in many contexts, that's hard to define, right? Um, life is complicated. Uh, the timelines are different. Uh, you know, are we measuring over a short? In this case, we had a really super hard problem. Uh, uh, I, I am so I'm so proud. I mean, the team that Giacomo led was incredibly broad group of people uh, from all over the world. Um, they had to they had to make requests of me and others, which were pretty bold in terms of the. You know, of the amount of time it would take. And uh, they wanted to keep experimenting and learning, um, but they also had to win the trust of uh, these incredibly competitive, uh, driven uh, sportsmen, athletes, uh, and their business owners, right? The, the people who are running the budgets and the engineers um, and all these people. So to me, it's that spirit of, you know, co collaboration, you know, bringing together everybody's different skills um, you know, uh, and and balancing the uh, the the preparedness to experiment um, with the need to stay focused on on real value uh, with whatever in whatever context it is. So I think this is a, just a great example of that, uh, which we try to bring everywhere, um, but not always, obviously, uh, with such uh, um, uh, with a big nice big silver cup at the end of it to wave in the air. I wish we did, but uh, but so I, I'm super proud of the te of the work that Giacomo and the team did, uh, and and mostly that you know, uh, as I said, um, you, you know, having having as it were happy clients is always a nice thing, and who could be happier than a team that's that's won uh, such an amazing championship? Uh, so that's some of my reflections, Pepe. Pepe, do you know examples of companies that are successfully using? applying this kind of techniques in our region in what sectors so Denise actually I, I have a great example on that uh, talking about complex manufacturing systems we have a client uh, who had to export their their product right to 160 different markets each of the market having different needs right different kinds of SKUs there were over 3,000 SKUs and we were trying to convert an animal, a given animal, into end products, right? That had to be exported to these 160 markets. And to do that, um, you have several manufacturing plants and the plants have risk constraints in terms of what, how they can process the animal, the different sanitary restrictions that you have in different markets, traceability restrictions that you have in different markets, so each plant could not do everything, right? So you had different plants that could do different things at different costs, right? So you have this hugely complex problem, 160 markets to serve, placing orders every day, 3,000 SKUs to, to produce, 17 plants with different uh, schemes. And how do you do this, right? So we apply the typical optimization uh, techniques that we use for these uh, complex problems, but we also apply reinforcement learning, right? And um, the, the, the result was really amazing, right? The, the, the reinforcement learning um, simulators were often beating the more, uh, the more simple and more used optimization techniques, right? 
Um, so we had a client, a very happy client as well. And um, we can do the same thing for other manufacturing um, companies, for other complex logistics or production systems. We can do the same thing for recommender systems, as Jeremy mentioned, next best action. And we've done some of that on an experimental way in problems like collections in banks. So we're very happy about uh, taking this innovation to clients and to put this into motion in very concrete um, you know, engagements where we can really solve business problem and create significant value, putting a lot of smart people to work together. So thank you, Giacomo, Jeremy, and Pepe. Now I'd like to address some of the questions sent by our audience. And the first question is here for Jeremy. Jeremy, how did the technology enable the sailors to achieve success and how would you respond to concerns that artificial intelligence and machines can outperform humans? Yeah, the famous uh, killer robot question, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, look, I mean, we touched on this earlier, Denise, but I, I, we firmly, I mean, obviously, there, there, automation is, is an important part of this. But in principle, um, the, uh, the idea is always to automate the things which are less creative and where consistency is valuable. Um, and in this particular case for, you know, for this team, um, you know, it, uh, as Giacomo mentioned earlier, if you wanted to test a, if in any environment, imagine you want to test something which you're changing by a very small amount every time. So you want to change like 10 different versions uh, uh, and you want to test it and you want to make sure you're testing it in the same way. That means you have to apply exactly the same conditions to every test and you have to keep doing it. That's actually a, not only difficult to do, especially in a complex environment like the water or a manufacturing environment, but it's also quite boring actually. Uh, so if you are confident that you can run consistent tests very, very fast in ways which mean that, you know, the humans can concentrate on the creative stuff, then that's actually quite motivating for the humans too. Uh, and this can apply to, you know, de designers or engineers as well as sportsmen. And a lot of, uh, a lot of what we're doing here is to, is to enable the uh, things that can be uh, done better and more efficiently and more consistently uh, without too much human intervention to be done that way, while therefore creating the opportunity for the human players to actually do something more interesting and more creative and test themselves. In this particular case, you know, uh, again, Giacomo mentioned the example of the sailors, you know, once they, once they are confident that the output that they're looking at works and is valuable, they can actually learn from it and they can then improve their performance. They could, the machine could not do, let's be very clear, no machine could do what those sailors did when they raced the boat around the water, right? Physically on the water, that had to be done by the humans. But to enable those experts to be even better at their job, and in this case, apparently, obviously, to be the best in the world at their job, the machines help them to do it. So that's, that's kind of how we look at it. It's a complex interaction uh I, I i think there are some jobs uh some there is some level of automation which is appropriately done better um taking risk out taking the um, you know boredom out of it some repetition out of it but that also enables more creativity on the other side and i think where we always uh, focus on is this opportunity to accelerate the learning for the humans so they can do a better job uh, uh and improve their performance I hope that answers your question. And Pepe, one question for you. Uh, what would you recommend to any executive trying to learn more about this topic? Of course, we have a, a few things that we have published on this. So, but we'd be more than happy to share our experiences, share how we can, you know, uh, think about these kind of problems, be it manufacturing, logistics, supply chain, recommender systems. Um, more than happy to bring Jeremy Giacomo on the team that did that and many other Quantum Black and McKinsey experts that are doing this for a living, right? So uh, more than happy to share that with everyone in, in particular settings. Uh, and we will get your requests through, through the chat or through email 
Okay, wonderful. So thank you again, Pepe, Jeremy, and Giacomo. And I'd like to thank also you who spent the last 45 minutes with us. For the full schedule of McKinsey Talks, go to www.mckinseytalks.com. There you can watch all the previous episodes and today's episode as well. You will also find access to the audio versions available on Spotify. Thank you again. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.